Um, so next we have Michael Mikus McKisson. Yeah. Okay. And talking about drone journal journalism and FAA life. Yeah, so I'll make this short. Uh, I'm one of the not science people. Uh, I'm a professor of practice, so I don't have a PhD. I don't do science. Um, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about how we are using drones. Um, and specifically, uh, the, biggest, and the, the biggest thing that we do in the class is we talk a little bit about the journalism, but a lot about the licensing. Um, you know, I think that more and more people are recognizing that if you're using um, so this is really what we focus on, is getting people the rules and regulations, the information that they need to be a pilot. Uh, we talk a lot about um, ethics uh, in journalism and drones, but also, you know, the ethics of, of just privacy concerns and that sort of thing, and of course, uh, the visuals. Um, so we've got that. Um, we got our drone uh, right in 2016 when the licensing became available, and we did this project. Um, where we took students, uh, you know, obviously to the, the Sonoran border, um, and then we also took a group of students up to um, the Canadian border uh, along the Canamex Highway, uh, really trying to illustrate the difference between the landscapes and the way that it works. Obviously there on the, the bottom you can see uh, the Border Patrol and the giant fence. Uh, we're on, um, in Canada, there's a dirt road. Uh, that you can drive on, and they just say, uh, you know, if you come in from the United States side to that dirt road, you know, just back to the United States. Uh, if you come in from Canada, just, you know, go back to Canada. Um, so we tried to use the, the drone to kind of uh, illustrate uh, those two places. That was our first project that we did. Sorry about it. Anyway, what we do now is, um, so we train students how to get their license. Uh, they get their license, and then now we have a, a contracting system um, where basically journalist outlets, media outlets, can hire myself or the student to film um, drone footage. Right? Again, not research. Um, this is a story we worked on about this woman, Sarah Sellers, who you may have heard of. Uh, she won second or third place in the Boston Marathon. She's a nurse here in Tucson. Um, and so we filmed drone, drone footage uh, of her training after she won the race and um, it has won like a regional Emmy uh, for the work. So um, what I've found, however, is we used to get hired a lot. We don't get hired so much anymore uh, because I basically trained myself out of a job. Um, because of the class, I've trained so many students, uh, they've gotten their license and now they're working for media organizations. They don't need me or our, our contracting group anymore, uh, which I guess is a good problem to have. Uh, and, and, you know, the students get jobs and, and they're working. At that rate. But, um, we've started working a little bit to help visualize um, research projects. Uh, so this was a public health uh, research um, group. They were looking at uh, pesticide overspray uh, and how far it drifts. And um, they wanted to try and visualize that. Uh, turned out it didn't work that great. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but this is a, a, a spray plane. I don't know what they're called. What are they called? Crop duster. Crop duster. That's what we're looking for. Um, and so we flew the drone over the crop duster as they were spraying. And we have video that you can actually see the spray drifting away from where they were spraying. Um, this is probably one of the most terrifying flights that I had done. There was a lot of communication with the pilot. Uh, it turns out that crop dusters are nuts. Uh, Crop dusting pilots are nuts, and they're like, I have no problem. So uh, I was terrified. Um, so we did that. Uh, and then this is just another project that I'm working on personally. Um, I am a bicyclist, and I am currently in the process of riding every single street and every single mile in Tucson um, and tracking it via GPS. Uh, you can see there on the left, this is a map. Blue is places I've done. Uh, red are places that I still have to do. Turns out there's about 2,500 miles in the Tucson proper. And then I'm taking drone photos of interesting places uh, along the way. So this is the photo on the right. It's just one of my recent ones. That is a, um, it's in Miracle Manor, which is right here. It was a trailer park that now has three trailers left in the trailer park. And these are all empty pads. Um, and I'm planning on either putting it together in a book or a website, um, sort of a journalistic, I'll interview people in the neighborhoods, and, and I'm just kind of doing that. 
And that's really it. Um, I think the next project that we want to work on is starting to use photogrammetry uh, with our drones. Um, that's not something you know, I've explored with my phone a little bit, um, but we're starting to work with VR and journalism. And so I'd like to start trying to make 3D of you know, border walls so that people can kind of walk around them, um, other objects that, that drones would help. Would help. That's really what we're doing. Nothing fancy, uh, just fun, just fun stuff. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing all of you. Yeah. I have a quick question. Uh -huh. coming up. Maybe. Yeah. There is. There is. Um, and, and, you know, so I saw that, and I, I don't know, the, the politics of, of classes mm -hmm. and, like, you know, I'm just like, oh, whatever. Um, but, yeah, I think that that might be something that could be useful coming out of this is, like, what is everybody doing? Where can you, you where can you cross pollinate and not step on people's toes? I did do that. I was actually curious about your engineering class. Is that open to anyone? Absolutely. You don't have to be an engineer. Cool. Well, one of the other things that we started doing that I didn't mention in this is um, this summer I learned how to solder and built a an FPV drone. You may have seen recently the bowling alley video. Does anyone recognize that? That one? So there was this amazing FPV video going through a bowling alley, um, like down the lane. Uh, and it was really incredible. There was another one that just came out from UNLV women's basketball where they were flying inside the stadium. So that's something we're doing because it's much more cinema cinematographic. Um, I will say that I learned that FPV drones are a lot harder to fly. A, a lot harder. Than Thank you very much. You got us right back on time. Um, I also want to make a, a, an announcement. We had some issues with the microphone with Zoom today, but now I've got it hooked up with uh, with my telephone. That was the cause of some of that audio. But anyhow, so uh, speakers kind of just know that's there and then repeat. So this is Jeff Gillen uh, from SNRE. He'll be telling us about multi-scale remote sensing for applied research and civil applications. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff. I am a research scientist over in the Arizona Remote Resources here on the campus. And I use aerial imagery to study and manage natural resources. I'm using drones for about 10 or 11 years for a variety of purposes. I have a long history in range science. Um, my current portfolio is kind of varied. I do some civil applications where I do mapping of uh, repairing areas and post fire. Uh, I have some stuff. Where I'm using hyperspectral drones for ID uh, ecosystem, using LIDAR uh, for estimating. We also have a drone class. I, I co-teach it in the fall uh, with Wim Van Leeuwen. So the kind of topic of my, uh, of my talk here, is, uh, throughout my career, I've noticed more and more that um, observations from multiple often needed to help us answer the question that we have at hand or to solve the problem. A lot of times, one scale doesn't quite do it. So evermore, uh, I'm using drones as kind of just one level of observation. For what we're uh, so with my short amount of time, I'm just going to touch on three projects that I'm working on now and uh, show you, you know, kind of the different different scales of observation that we're using. So they're all around Tucson. First one is Bighorn Fire. So I am uh, classifying vegetation before and after Bighorn Fire. We're using field measurements, uh, drone imagery. Uh, airplane optical and airplane LIDAR, uh, satellite imagery. I'm doing some mapping along the Santa Cruz River, field measurements, drone imagery, uh, airplane optical. I have a project down in Santa Rita, and this is about using hyperspectral imagery. I have hyperspec from help, uh, spectral radio. Hyperspectral drone, hyperspectral aerial photography from. Let's just start with the Bighorn Fire. Y'all remember that uh, June 2020, it burned about 120,000 acres in the Santa Catalina. So I was hired by Pima County Regional Flood Control to help them answer the question: you know, What are the flooding implications for massive change in vegetation wildfire? Objectives were to measure vegetation cover before and after the fire uh, over the entire Santa Catalina. And also support uh, ongoing research from U.S. fire vegetation composition, 
and also uh, soil. In terms of remote sensing assets, we use small RTK drones, plane uh, optical image, LIDAR, and that was all from uh, And then I use satellite imagery from Planet. I don't have a lot of time to go into the details. I'll just show you some pretty pictures. Point cloud that I made from. Uh, uh, I did about 10 or 11 plots up on Mount Lemon, frame products like these. And so these are to support the field measurements that are going. On. They have their, their fine scale measurements, and we have a little bit larger, you know, a few hectares in size so they can estimate uh, vegetation traits like cover, composition, you know, things. We're also using the drone imagery to train the, the higher uh, level. Satellite imagery for the point cloud. You can see some of the trees were damaged or, or burnt to a crisp. So here's one of the kind of the main outputs from the classified map of the entire Santa Catalina Mountains. Right here in the middle is Summer Haven. All of these polygons are watersheds and they're labeled. What you're looking at is a classified map. This is from June 2019, so this is a year before the Bighorn Fire. It's a simple classification. A lot of trees and shrubs are in dark green. Uh, bare ground and rock are in the brown, and the bright green is herbaceous. We're trying to see what the vegetation cover was before and after the fire. Here's September 2020, so about a month, a couple months after the fire. Now you see all this black. All that black is, is uh, indicative of dead trees and shrubs. So we're using these products, giving them to the Pima County so they can estimate um, kind of their, their runoff, precip runoff uh, coefficient. So besides just two dimensions, we're also working in three dimensions. This is an image product uh, using pre and post fire LIDAR. We didn't have coverage for the entire mountain, so we have this little um, This is vegetation volume change is what you're looking at. So the, the areas in red, like up here by Summer Haven, are the areas that had the most vegetation burned. So those were really tall trees, and now they are nothing. Areas of yellow and green were either it didn't burn very much at all, or there was actually an increase. Like up here in the green, this, this area was Summer Haven, and it did not burn. Actually, the vegetation grew a little bit. Yeah, so we're giving that to Pima County and also to help them understand. All right, going to move on to the next project. So we are mapping vegetation along the Santa Cruz River. I'm getting a lot of help from my assistant, Chloe Peck, here. So to orient you, so this is the Santa Cruz River. This is a Grant Road down here. Here's Avra Valley Road. So this is the northwest part of Tucson. And again, this is sponsored by Pima County Regional Flood Control. Their question is, what is the vegetation composition in the stretch of the river? And they want to know that for restoration purposes, uh, to ID and uh, remove invasive species, and Total vegetation volume for flood implications. So, in terms of our remote sensing assets, we had airplane imagery and airplane lidar uh, taken for the whole corridor, and also used small RTK drones for uh, a smaller, more specific area of interest. Kind of where CBO and Rito all meet. I'm kind of interested in that area. This is a, a zoomed-in picture of drone imagery. This is a drone ortho mosaic. I used about uh, thousand images st stitched together, and so this is an ongoing project. And our, you know, our, our goal is just to estimate as best we can, the species level as possible, what vegetation is there. Chloe's been doing a lot of uh, work with me in, in terms of working on classification. Here's just an example of what kind of the ongoing process is. A lot of the trees already kind of figured out. Uh, we have a giant tamarack, uh, tamarisk uh, patch right here. The county's interested in that because they're probably going to. Uh, remove it. Actually, done doing a lot of removal right here, and they're going to move. It. Okay, so that's pretty quick. <laughs> Let's move on to the third project. Um, so for this one, we are interested in detecting the presence of cactus with hyperspectral imagery. Uh, land managers, ecologists, sometimes are interested in you know, cactus population. If we did this down at the Santa Rita Experimental Range, on. And our objectives were to take a handheld spectral radiometer and develop a cacti index. That index and apply it to drone imagery and airplane imagery. ID cactus uh, compared with other uh, non succulent vegetation. Uh, so we had a drone mounted uh, head wall nano hyperspec, and then we used neon uh, hyperspec. So here's a spectral signature from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. This is the handheld. A spectrometer, uh, and these each of these lines is a different type of vegetation. So 
so we found with cactus has this very interesting water absorption dip right here at about 972 nanometers. So we can leverage that dip to then develop a cacti index. So it's very similar to NDVI specifically for cactus. Took that, uh, through, uh, took that same idea, collected some drone imagery. This is a uh, MH3600. Um, it's interesting, it has this uh, nano head wall. Push broom sensor, so that, that took a little bit of getting used to as opposed to. Uh, there's a lot of putting the, the pieces back together <laughs> at the end of the processing workflow. So I'll just show you some quick results. So this is a, a red, green, blue image from the drone. Here's our cacti index image. And as you can see, there's prickly pear, there's choya, there's barrel cactus, uh, and it um, pops out pretty well. So how well can we ID, ID cactus from? Uh, we wrote a paper on it, it's in review, trying to get public. So that's probably about my time. Um, I got to mention, I'm, I'm always looking for new funding and collaboration. I'm a soft funded researcher. So, uh, and if uh, you have any questions, please let me know. Yes. Why to do it? Just just to scale up, you know. Um, yeah, the idea is can we map cactus over large areas? You know, that's the goal. And we started from the ground level and just kind of worked our way up. This is kind of the, the idea from when he's been wanting to publish this for like 20 years or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, we'll, we'll do it from drone and, and airplane. Related question. I mean, so it seems like if you wanted to come up with an index, you would. Yeah, right. The idea is that hyperspectral imagery is going to become more available. There are several hyperspectral satellites that are coming on. It's going to become more common. It is expensive. All right. Thank you all. <laughs> all right. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Um, so it's a great opportunity for me to be here today. And uh, I feel like a very kind of early stage hobbyist hearing everybody talk about drones because I thought, oh, I fly drones, but apparently I don't. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting to see. I mean, this is the drone uh, that we have in an apartment. There's a lot of information I've, I've learned already. Um, I know that we can register our drones, so that's something that we have to do. Um, but a big part is I'm also not a licensed pilot. Uh, and we started flying drones early on. And as soon as we started seeing all these regulations, it kind of drove us away from flying on campus because a lot of the time uh, I'd like students to kind of get a different experience. So I teach in the School of Architecture and my main area of expertise is design and energy conservation. A lot of the things that we do is teach students how to design buildings, you know, how to design a ceiling, for example. You know, you put in a four inch LED light and they get kind of you know, stuck in that space of designing within a building. So drones was a great opportunity to, you know, look outside the walls, experience spaces. And we have a very big program. In one of the years, we actually had 11 students from um, there were nine different countries, and they haven't never been to Tucson before. It's a great tool to understand really the landscape that we're in. So I'm going to talk about drones that we use in kind of three different areas. Um, one in education and how we use areas of research and then how it's applicable in practice. So in the first area of education is uh, for architecture was the site experience. We didn't want students to really just rely on using Google Maps to understand the site or to just go there and visit to take pictures, but they have an opportunity and that's part of where how do you get, you know, a group of 10 students to become a like, pilot for a 10 minute flight experience. And then we'll we'll never see them again. But this is some of the examples of a project that we're working on. This is McDowell Park in North Phoenix. Um, and the idea behind this is to understand the major landscape of the project that they're working on, and to really see all these different arroyos. You can see they're very kind of vibrant. Um, those dry arroyos. And really, if you haven't been in Arizona, you don't understand how big the arroyos are, how important it is to respect it in the design. And this kind of became the layout to how students start finding areas in which they design. That was a, a very interesting experience. 
Another project was for um, Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument. And this, this was a, a way to introduce the project to students where they get a different experience. And then the students use the drones as a way to present their final project um, to what they can do. This was a terrifying moment where we lost drone connection and we didn't know that it's gonna fly back, but it did, which was great. But that was the exact same moment. The students, so they use this to kind of overlay the information on this is what we do, this is the landscape of environments. We have students from Russia, from India, Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, and they really don't know what it's like to be in a lush desert landscape. So this was a great way to look at the different buildings that they're doing. Uh, this was our retired program director, and uh, it, it's really kind of important to see what, what the desert landscape is and what all the areas in which they were doing the design was. Um, now, Herb, you can look away. This is a little bit too close to the person. <laughs> this is using a, a camera on a stick. We'll, we'll go with that. Well, the, the exercise here were students doing uh, research uh, uh, to identify areas where we really walk on campus and how that can have an impact on their physiological responses in their system. What ways in which their surface area of body can be exposed to solar radiation as they walk south towards campus, for example, during noon when they're just going to get a coffee, but their body is seeing all this solar exposure and then they're like, you're stressed, you're stressed, you're stressed, you're stressed, because they're squinting so much because of the solar exposure. So this was a, a research where we're looking at opportunities to create green walkways or connectors on campus that kind of create this protective layer from solar radiation. And the drones really helped understand that scale. Um, in research, there was uh, another opportunity that we were looking at, and Michael, we were just talking about this, is ways in which we can use drone mapping and photogrammetry to recreate existing this research um, area, uh, uh, my team and I, we were looking at ways in which, this is a labyrinth if anybody doesn't know, it's used as a meditative tool. You're supposed to slowly walk towards the center and uh, thinking about a problem that you have, and then you slowly walk back thinking about a resolution. It's kind of like a healing yoga similar exercise. Uh, and we wanted to provide this as an opportunity where, hey, you don't actually need to go there. Maybe, you know, we can use technology to bring that to you. So this is uh, pretty much what we try to do, and we're still in the very early stages of using drones to create a map of photogrammetry around uh, the area where the labyrinth is. And one of the main things, uh, Jeffrey, you were talking about, is looking at all the different areas in which we can get a crisp image so that it could be really recreated as an actual experience, or does it look like it's a kind of shape? We're still very early on in identifying that connection between drone technology and VR and how it could be applicable in a way that's not going to make people busy, in a way that's going to have high quality imagery and that sort of direction. And then the last in the field of practice, there is one simple way is to measure progress of construction projects, right? We, this is a, a site. Obviously, you can see that it's, uh, this is very early on, just looking at uh, traffic maneuvering in site. You can see that it's a pretty empty site, but uh, clients and contractors like that sort of imagery to understand the large scale project and what kind of development looks like. Um, and you can see as the stages progress, you can easily get an understanding of what the project looks like, how big of a scale, and what this is. This is a 100,000 uh, 100, gallon water tank. Um, you can see it's a pretty busy site. But it's a great tool for contractors to understand the progress, see the progress and document it in a way that's just much more visual than seeing still imagery. So it's, it's a very, um, I mean, it's compared to like all the science analysis, nothing happens, this is the end product. So it's not being as a tool in this case, but this is the actual product. And then in the last kind of application is we've seen roof inspections at you mentioned facilities also being used, uh, obviously, in areas of architecture where we measure, uh, you know, opportunities where it could be problematic. This is a small-scale building, but it's just a, where we can see water ponding for, uh, you know, drainage or problems for leaks. And then on the left-hand side, which is a, a much bigger part of design and energy conservation, is to identify areas of leaks in buildings where you have a lot of air conditioning escaping an area of your building or C 
seeing solar exposure on this or identifying opportunities for PV panels and applications for our project. So a lot of these, and that's a big part of, of what I'm here today is to understand ways in which first I'd like to get licensed and then second understand more of the, the U of A regulations because I need in like a very short time frame of the semester to get a group of 10 to 20 students. Um, they're all master students so that they're here for three semesters to really get them engaged in all these areas of opportunities in a quick way and not to have them stuck in all of the, uh, you know, all of the regulations that they have to go through, but what are ways in which they can apply this. And most of the time we would go um, out of campus so that they get the experience, especially in architecture now, using drones has become very important just for, um, you know, the imagery, for taking pictures of, not necessarily looking at the signs, but finding a way where the drone becomes an and this is, uh, this is it, this is uh, the three things that I will look at, education, research, and architecture. And so that's, that's the point when we started first purchasing the drone was when the FAA indicated that, you know, the researcher is under a hobby. If you're not becoming a profit out of it, that's the point where we're like, all right, great, let's get a drone, right? And then all the regulations that we had, all these students, we didn't have a pilot, and it's like, ooh, we didn't really have time to invest into the with, with the how drones are becoming feasible and less expensive, and I mean, we're not looking at you know hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of drones, but five hundred dollar drones is pretty much capable of doing the kind of work that we want, and that kind of accessibility is driving us towards well, we may need to look at getting a license and identify the procedures where we can get students ready. Uh, absolutely, I mean, uh, we we're still in in practice using um, old surveying methods where we go out, laser measure areas of elevation and site. But seeing now the capabilities of drones, it's very easy to go to a large, I mean, the McDowell Park project is a hundred acre site. And to capture that on an architecture scale for building design, you need a very close proximity. So that's one area where we see application of drones for flying over a large area to capture that sort of data would be very useful. Um, lot less time consuming, but I think the important part for us is to create that relationship between the designer and the space. Um, and that, that's the benefit, I think, of holding the controller. And that's what I want the students to do, is hold it and then look at the screen and navigate the areas to create, you know, we talked about curiosity and what drives it. And that's, I think that's the part where I'm most interested. Uh, but definitely, I think that with the direction of drones, it's, it's become an everyday tool in most architectural Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Next, we have Charles Rivello. I'm getting everybody's pronunciation right. If not, <laughs> okay. And um, uh, yeah, from the College of Optical Sciences, coverage area coverage using drone mounted multi camera array. Great. Right, so, I, my name is Charles. Um, I'm from College. I'm a master's student. Uh, one of the projects that I have. So, brief overview. I'm going to go over our group's facilities, background information on this project, the uh, system we fabricated, the field tests we've done, uh, going to start deploying, as well as a performance metric. Um, so, our group has a number of drones that we from your standard, now kind of ubiquitous uh, quadcopters, everything from a mini to vertical takeoff platforms that we're going to start playing. Um, in blue are the off-the-shelf sensors, um, are these camera arrays that we've been designing, different wavelengths, visible, short wave, infrared, long wave. Um, so some background, um, aerial photography, that has been a thing. With, uh, with recent advancements in drone technology, they're, they're much cheaper, their endurance is much better, the cameras are. That's made this proliferation um, in this commercial drone market. Not a very expensive way to carry out an operation. All uh, aircraft do these things. Of large area coverage, that is. Exactly what it sounds like, just big open areas of ground that are that are imaged for the full context rather than a few on the ground. Um, applications being visual mapping, surveying, uh, 
studies program I'm working with um, University of Central Florida on that involves GPS denied. A little graphic on the bottom kind of shows what I mean when I when I mean array. It is multiple cameras in the ultra wide field of view. As you fly over an area. The thing I hope to convince you of is why this is a way. It's not just an alternative to more traditional methods of aerial imagery. Whether it's a single camera or a single cameras, you can get a very wide maybe get horizon to horizon images, but your sound resolution bottom is very poor. Prove that ground resolution. You can use narrow field of view, but it. Not very um, and if you employ a system that switches fields of view, require more precise alignment, more time and focus by the operator. Gimbals, they're, they're so there's a lot more moving part. Um, keep a gimbal to get area coverage. You can introduce motion blur into the imagery. You have these possible registers. So with an imaging array, have enjoyed the benefits of both. We have the very robust fixed system, no moving parts. But since it's multiple fields of view all lined up, we can use narrow individual cameras and get better. They're just a graphical um, uh, satellite image of building um, three hard stones throw down. Um, but in terms of a, a four camera array, we have these four key steps. But that's what sweeps through it. So the system we have that has been prototyped so far uses four monochromatic visible sensors that were originally meant for Vision Arduino platform. We have together in a 3D printed housing. Real flow chart. We have our SolidWorks model. We fitted together system and then and this is all fed into a so our field tests follow a fairly strict um, operating procedure we count all the local weather conditions run through on the left we run through one software like checks making sure we running right aircraft but uh, in the center is progress field test and on the right is what we we have these bricks we fabricated. We're going to fly over those to look as well as looking at these black white contrasts to try to calculate the MTF from them. compared to the bottom there is the runway we fly off of. Uh, a bit uh, taking some physical measurements of the runway. So once we have the resolution data process, so we're going to compare those to imagery from the system. Um, again, they're, they're monochromatic visible sensors. They're not actually stitched together. The four fields of view are just kind of butted against each other. There might be a half to a full overlap between each one. There are some measurements underneath the images as well as not from the lens we were using. Um, it sounds very bright, and since cameras were meant for an indoor setting, uh, we needed filters over the lenses. A um, little bit of a little bit of vignetting around the around the edges there. Half built was built out of available parts and kind of necessity. We found a module we're going to be more rigorous about that now, and come up with this fine uh, optimization method. Actually, do math to figure it out now. Um, I'll describe actual systems as we're using mobile lenses. Um, this gives us optimized fields for a set resolution that we are found. But this is the routine that we've started to use um, sensors and lenses to build them. And then to measure performance. Um, metric that we've come up with takes the probability of recognition based off of a layers level 
or a V50 value from uh, looking at uh, the case of vision navigation, the neural network's ability to recognize conclusions from what, with the work we've done so far. We found that four cameras are actually not sufficient to meet our image quality uh, requirements. Uh, and that's both in the visible wavelengths, 400 to 700 long wave thermal infrared. We, we found that we need higher performance cameras and our processor as Raspberry Pi, certainly not up to the task. We're working on kind of doing with both targets uh, of the lamp verify some of the R and the hope is to quantify the MTF. And then following from that, our future work, we're going to be building new systems. We have a higher visible system in the works um, that's either going to be six or eight cameras. Um, but for long wave infrared, um, we're going to be building both a four camera and an eight camera. We're going to be look, looking into doing work in the short wave infrared. Instead of Raspberry Pis, we're using these Intel Ford computers. Um, um, it is, so they, they are kind of oriented, um, kind of parallel with the wingspan. Um, need to use more cameras to not so much increase the overall field of view that we're seeing, like the ground resolution. The four camera system that we've built and the ones that we've modeled um, kind of awful. So uh, by in including more cameras, we're able to narrow. Um, so for for my project that I'm working with UCF on, 25 centimeters in that case is much too much resolution. Um, but this is also flying at 400 feet. So having 25 centimeters at 400 feet get worse as the altitudes increase. But well, um, when I'm working with, um, this is just on like a hobby grade. Um, the the Raspberry Pi system we have, all said and done, was about two thousand dollars. The four camera long wave system that I've just put an order in, thousand dollars. So it's a different different price. Yeah. Okay. So so next we have uh, Hussein. Again. Ras Guptar. Ras Guptar, and he's from the uh, Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. Um, well, first, I want to—I think he'll, he'll mention that he's hosting a, a speaker tomorrow afternoon, and he'll, he'll tell us I'll about that. Okay, awesome. And then, uh, and I'll be talking about continuum deformation approaches to large-scale UAS coordination and traffic management. Uh, so, thank you very much for uh, for this event. So, I just joined the. Uh, the University of Arizona in fall 2021. Uh, so, and I, uh, I am working there. I established a lab with uh, which is called Scalable Move and Reversibility of the Lab. And the focus of my research is on application motivated research problem related to decision making on the uncertainty, human robotic interactions, swarm robotic autonomy, UAS traffic management, intelligent transportation, formal specification and verification, and finite status abstraction of dynamical systems. So, uh, uh, so just uh, I, over the fall semester, we I, I think I don't have the picture here, or oh, it's here. So we built 60, uh, assembled 60 quad capsules and uh, 10 M3 uh, 30 quad capsules and 50 mini quad capsules. And the M3 30 quad capsules were all assembled and so I tested in my lab and then um, they are ready for uh, for, my, uh, for a larger scale swarm coordination. So, and then I would like to talk about, so in my research, I would like to approach multi-agent coordination by applying the principles of continuum mechanics 
and I would like to classify multi-agent coordination problem into two groups. Uh, the first one, which is Lagrangian based continuum uh, swarm coordination, is the one that we have a fixed number of agents and we wanted to safely uh, coordinate them in an obstacle laden environment. And the other one, we have fixed space, but uh, uh, the number of agents can, that can use this space can change with time. Uh, so, it's like UAS traffic. Management. So the first problem can be planned uh, by using the principles of Lagrangian continuum mechanics, and the second one can be uh, appropriately planned by applying by modeling it as Eulerian continuum mechanics. So I would like to uh, talk about the second one first, and um, we have. Uh, I have an active award uh, on this uh, topic, and uh, the co-PI, uh, Dr. Latkin, will give a talk tomorrow uh, in the AME department, and I will talk about her talk at the end of this slide. So the idea of UAS traffic management is that we come up with the uh, infrastructure that uh, in core, uh, that have uh, that offers a scalability, heterogeneity, and resilience to UAS uh, failure, and such an infrastructure does not exist now. So, what does this mean? This means that we wanted that low attitude UAS coordination maximize the the UAS, the UAS aerospace usability. This is classified as a scalability. We should accommodate a variety of UAS applications, missions, and vehicle types, and also interaction of ATM with UTM, and also uh, must be resilient to anomalous situation or sudden failure. So to this end, we came up with the three layers of continuum deformation, a large layer, we modeled it as Eulerian continuum mechanics, the small scale, which uh, UAS can move either as a group or individually. We apply the principles of Lagrangian continuum mechanics to safely coordinate them in the aerospace. And we also define an interface between the Lagrangian and Eulerian continuum mechanics so that we properly incorporate hard constraints like that sudden failure, or we say you should know, know never fly over no fly zone and so on. So, uh, and we implemented that for just recently, it hasn't been published yet. So we, we developed this model for to model UTM above Tucson. And you see that this is downtown Tucson area. So we applied the physics-based model and we, uh, and as you can see, four UAS can simultaneously use simultaneously and safely use the aerospace above Tucson and for different applications. So this was the first problem. And the second problem uh, was about Lagrangian-based continuum deformation of multi-agent system. Again, I have one award with Dr. Atkins, and it was uh, awarded when I was at Michigan, and she was my supervisor. So, uh, and project uh, is about, so uh, over the past few years, uh, we have seen uh, several uh, unfortunate uh, natural disasters, such as California wildfire, Mexico City earthquake, and Hurricane Harvey in Houston. And in those situations, we see that the affected region may be out of power, water, and electricity, and various infrastructure and telecommunication system may be damaged, roads can be blocked by debris, and we need to come up with a system that facilitates transport, uh, transportation of supplies from supply center to people in the disaster uh, affected area. And if you look at 
this is an area of natural disaster, and you see that you can never uh, use the uh, common transportation system to help people because everything is broken. And so our idea is to just treat swarm as particles of the formable body. They can, and then they can either individually uh, or uh, either cooperatively carry payloads individually and then safely pass through narrow passages and uh, um, avoid collision. And uh, they have, they are uh, <clears throat> uh, enabled to perform all safety critical functioning. They should be. Such a system should be a scalable, a smart, resilient to failure, and manu uh, maneuverable and computationally efficient. So, uh, so these are for this system over the past few years. I have studied all this problem of scalability, uh, which means that the total number of agents, the model should be such that the total number of UIS that can participate in such a mission can be um, the, the large or at least in theory can be large before the specified safety. Resilient, if, uh, if some failure happens, how they can recover safety. And a smart, where we, that we, we, see, we see that. Okay, and optimize, and then we perform safety for that, and then also optimization. We optimize, so to, to come up with that system, we perform uh, safety, specify safety, verify safety, and then model it, uh, optimize this deformation so that they can move. And we also, the system can move either fully autonomously or they can share decision making with the human supervisor. So the human supervisor can just say uh, high level motion direction and what they onboard. Uh, uh, system can perform surf safety, and this is a cooperative payload transport, and that's it. And I would like to say, uh, I think I, I use my time for introducing the speaker tomorrow that we will have in the aerospace engineering at 4 p.m. Dr. Ella Atkins will present and the uh, title of her talk with the environment mapping and urgent landing planning for the low attitude US operations. And he also has an open discussion that uh, uh, operated, moderated by David tomorrow at 10 a.m. in Zoom in 7.15. So you are welcome to attend. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, that was a, uh, a great uh, talk. Thank you very much. And and again, yeah, I hope uh, people will have a chance to uh, come in and listen to the uh, talk you mentioned yesterday. I sent it out to the UAS list, uh, as well as join our roundtable discussion uh, to meet with um, Dr. Atkins. <laughs> so next, uh, one thing that keeps on coming up on, on our monthly drone calls is uh, what are we going to do about new laws related to uh, the use of DJI in research, DJI equipment, because so many people rely on DJI uh, equipment. Um, and so we're fortunate to have um, Adam Lisberg, who's Corporate Communications Director for North America for DJI, DJI and he's going to uh, tell us about uh, DJI drones and scientific research, what you need to know now. Okay. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for the introduction and, and sorry about the technical delay here. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you. I'm, I'm coming to you from the New Jersey campus of the University of Arizona. Um, so I'm jealous of your weather. Even if it's raining outside, I'm jealous of your weather right now. Um, thank you for the opportunity here. As David said, um, a lot of people have a lot of questions about how DJI drones work and whether there are restrictions that are going to be put in place that could affect your ability to use, to, to have your choice of product. And I wanna be very clear, I'm not here to lobby for DJI and I'm not asking anyone to go tell their Congress member that DJI is the greatest drone company in the world. That's my job. Um, what we are talking to scientists 
and police officers and firefighters and industrial inspectors and engineers about is there are measures that would take away your ability to make the best choice. If someone else has a better drone out there, you should be free to buy that. But it ought to be your choice. And that uh, decision should not be forced on you because of, frankly, spurious fears about data security. Um, I want to I want to address that in the forefront. We've never shied away from these questions. DJI drones, keep your data safe. If you have any concerns that you are flying in a sensitive location or that data, that even though you're flying for the public good and for collecting information that can help advance scientific progress, um, if you have any concerns that something that you're collecting could be sensitive, that's why we make our drones that they can fly without any internet connection. You can switch your drone into local data mode or you can put your phone on airplane mode if you have any kind of concern. And once you have that data, you never have to share it with us or anyone else. There are people who say DJI is a company based in China. So if the Chinese government ever asked for your data, they'd have to hand it over. If we don't have your data in the first place, that's not even an issue. We, we, we build these systems this way so that you can use it without having to worry about those kinds of larger issues. However, there are people who um, would like to take away your choice because they are afraid because we are headquartered in China. And this is a real threat. The issue has been out for a while and there have been various proposals, some of them enacted that so far have affected you, drone users um, that are using, that have been um, uh, using drones in ways that touch the Departments of Defense, Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, and especially relevant for scientists, Department of Interior, that have, because of the data security fears, it has been harder to use a DJI drone uh, in any operation where it's, uh, it would be purchased with government funds, operated with government funds, used by a contractor, uh, hired with government funds, even used over government lands. And these kinds of proposals have had a real impact in, for example, in the Department of Interior itself, they use drones to set wildfire, to set controlled burns, to block future wildfires that would, uh, to measure stream erosion, to, to count wildlife in remote areas. And a lot of these tasks are far better accomplished with drones. Yet I don't need to tell you guys the story of, of how drones make your work safer, more effective, more efficient. You, you live that every day. Um, as these measures have come through, they have had a real negative impact on how Department of Interior and uh, has been able to do its job. And the fear is that would affect your work as well. So what we are trying to do is raise the alarm that these threats are real. There's a bill called the American Security Drone Act that would, with a few exceptions, block most government agencies from being able to buy, operate, contract, or allow the use of any drone made by a Chinese company. The, you under, presumably you understand how overbroad that is and how deleterious that would be for your ability to keep doing the work that you have. You would have to not buy DJI drones in the future. You may be able, may, may be forced to scrap the fleets you already can, that you already have. The, the language of this bill, the American Security Drone Act, is already included in two different uh, anti, I don't want to say anti, but uh, China bills that are in play in the House and the Senate. You, you may have heard that the House has something called the America Competes Act. The Senate has a version called USICA, the United States Innovation and Competition Act. The, the American Security Drone Act is included in both of them. It is not too late to call your or write to your members of Congress, your representatives, your senators, and flag for them the immediate impact that a measure like this would have on your work. If it would force you to scrap research, to start a study all over again, to lose the ability to perform aerial surveillance of a, an issue that you've been studying for years, you need to let them know. A lot of things move through Washington because people um, are, are, are pursuing a larger goal, but don't understand the real world consequences. You understand those consequences and they could be very severe for you. Uh, you need to speak up. Your universities and your trade associations have government affairs departments. They need to know the risk. They are the ones who presumably already have relationships with your members of Congress and can bring up these issues. And I think the message needs to be, again, it's not don't ban DJI on behalf of DJI. It's 
don't take away my ability to decide what aerial product is best for my use. If I want to buy an all-America flag-waving made in America drone, um, the, the, I, as the DJI guy, I, I know that that may cost more and be less capable in one of our models. But if that's what you want, you should have that right. And if you want to choose ours or one of our Chinese competitors, you ought to have that right too. Your members of Congress need to know that. And I think the message through your government relations departments, if you can, is you would really like to see the American Security Drone Act dropped from the bill. If politically they're unable to carry the weight to get it dropped, you need to have an exemption put in for what you do. If you get grants for NOAA, through NOAA, for some reason that is already included. Uh, the NTSB is included, but vast swaths of academic research are not. Do you do work uh, through the Department of Education? Do you get grants through the Department of Education? Do you get grants through any other federal agency? Um, you, you would be blocked out unless you can get an exemption from that measure. So I, I'm sorry I don't have a slide for you, um, but if, if I could ask you to write down one thing, my name is Adam Lisberg. My email is adam dot Lisberg, L-I-S-B-E-R-G at dji.com. Reach out to me. I'm happy to send you material validating what I said about the security of our drones, but also pointing you to the language that is in these bills and helping guide you to what kinds of messages you'd like to get to your representatives and your senators to help try to blunt the impact of what this can mean. Uh, I, David had just sent me a note. You can forward this information to the participants. I will get that to him later today. Be on the lookout for that. Thank you again. I'm ha I, I'm having, I can't hear you, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have if David is able to drop them in the chat. Question. Someone says, when we connect our drones to the internet, we have a DJ account that tracks the flight logs and updates the firmware, et cetera. We can fly without giving that info, but what about when we upgrade the software? Could the Chinese government get that information or is it protected? The short answer is, depending on which kind of drone you have, um, this is aimed more at our professional ones. I don't know the technical, I don't know what model you're using, um, but we build it so that you can download a soft, a firmware upgrade, connect it physically to your drone through a, our newer drones through USB or else by putting it onto a micro SD card and uploading it in a one-way connection without having to do a data secure, a, 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 um, without having to have your drone connected to the internet. And to assuage the fear there that your next firmware update could suddenly have a back door built into it, um, the initial conditions that I said would still apply. You'd never have to fly your drone with an internet connection. Once you land, you never have to upload your data to DJI or to anyone else. Uh, question is, every time I fly my drone, it asks to update the firmware, the FlySafe database, or things like that. How can we deal with that without sending information? The, um, the, up, you, you, if you have that information security concern, you can do those updates not over the air, as I said, but instead through a connection from your computer or by putting it onto an SD card and updating it off that. Um, the, 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 the principle remains the same that you are able to do offline updates. And then when you gather data on your next flights, you still can keep that entirely to yourself. If you have questions about particular models, I'm not a technical guy. There may be some uh, tweak that, that I'm not aware of. Feel free to email me directly and I can get you in touch with one of our technical experts. Um, UA already did take a step and is in the process of preventatively banning DJI. I'm assuming that's University of Arizona. Um, I'm very sorry to hear that. It sounds like that is a proactive stance that's not actually prompted by, well, it's not actually prompted by a legitimate security concern, but not prompted by a, uh, an existing government restriction that I'm aware of. Um, the question is, why isn't DJI more proactive with the U.S. government lobbying? The, the answer is we are. We are doing the best we can. It is, um, it, it is a difficult time in, uh, in Washington to be advocating for a Chinese company. Um, but what we have said from the start, and I've been here six years, 
is that we have, there are very smart people in China who have come up with great tools that are doing great things all over the world. They're enabling scientific research, they're creating businesses, they're making movies, they're saving lives. And we have, we have tried to make that point as best we can, that when you ban a technology based on where it comes from, you are hurting yourself, you're hurting America. We, it, it is a, uh, we're not a company that buys full page newspaper ads uh, to talk about our perspective on government relations issues. But honestly, there are so many people in Washington who will instinctively discount anything that comes from a Chinese company that we think the far better advocate is you. It is people who are using your drones in America who care about security. And, and by the way, I don't wanna dismiss out of hand worries about what could happen to sensitive data. Most of the data that you're working with, just like most of the data that you generate when you're flying a drone for fun, it's not sensitive at all. But it's, it's legitimate to ask what is happening with this. That's why we have built our systems so that you don't have to share anything if you don't want to. And it is, uh, we, we have lobbyists, we have lobbyists on contract, we have staff lobbyists in Washington, and they're always going into meetings with members of Congress. But honestly, you carry more weight than we do. An American researcher, just like an American police officer, firefighter, business owner, in tower inspector who doesn't want to have to go back to climbing up on top of roofs when they could use a drone more safely and efficiently. Um, you are the ones who will be most directly affected by one of these ill-considered bans. You know, tell your members of Congress, have the Ameri Association of American Universities, uh, the APLU, they're, they've been active on this issue. Let them know how vital this is for you and what the real world costs would be for you of a policy like this taking effect. It sounds like the bell has rung, so I will log off here. Feel free to reach out to me in the future. I'll get David material to share with you later today. Thanks again. So um, this is a fantastic discussion. Um, I, I think, it, you know, it, hopefully it'll be possible to, to get Adam to join one of our, our um, monthly calls uh, so we can follow up. It was unfortunate that, we, you know, all the different hops that had the information had to take to get back and forth. but. Um, in order to keep moving on, um, I want to have, um, <coughs> oh, I think I put the wrong one up. Uh, sorry, I think Brett Carr is next. Yeah, okay. Um, geez. And Brett from Lunar and Planetary Library will be talking about drones at volcanoes, new perspectives for science and hazards. Um, he has a lot of videos and actually... Hopefully work. Hopefully work. Yeah. I wonder if that enabled editing. I don't know. And then the security issues. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Thank well, you. thank. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah. So um, this is uh, yeah going to be a kind of a brief survey of some of the work uh, at volcanoes uh, I've done using drones, kind of starting from kind of the general observations and working up to some of the science applications I'm working on. And uh, I'll also just preface, this is you know, focused primarily on, on, on my background and my expertise with drones. There's a lot of other applications um, that uh, other researchers are using drones at volcanoes that I don't have experience with. So this is, there's a lot more than just uh, what I'm showing here. And so the first thing you can imagine with using a drone to study an active volcano is Access to the otherwise inaccessible. Volcanic eruptions are very hazardous things that you cannot get close to. The image in the lower left is kind of what we could see from the ground during this eruption. And of course, the video, we put a drone a couple hundred meters into the air. This is what we can see. We can see the vent, we can see the flow, um, and a lot of just different processes out there. And so these are new perspectives of volcanic eruptions that we couldn't get before um, the past decade when these kind of relatively accessible consumer drones um, became available. Um, and so you can just imagine when, before this, we are either, you know, volcanologists were either on the ground looking at this from as safely, from as close as safely possible on the ground, or we had to do expensive helicopter flights at greater distances. Um, videos like these, being able to see vent processes, lava flow processes like this, um, at high resolution um, is really eye-opening um, for the studies uh, for the study of volcanoes. This video and the previous one from the recent eruption in Iceland uh, last year, video was taken by the 
uh, PI for the lab I'm in, uh, Christopher Hamilton. So this is showing straight down, looking into vents. Um, these are videos that weren't possible even 10 years ago. Um, uh, and so, you know, the immediate applications you can see is simply the ability to observe where where the eruption is, where it isn't, the areas it's affecting. It's incredibly useful for hazard response. So this is a video during the eruption of Kilauea in 2018. Uh, that's the vent in the dead, uh, in the, just the center of the image there. And I was part of a group flying um, to look at the possible inundation of a geothermal power plant, which is going to come into view here. Uh, so you can see how close it is um, to that um, to those vents in the upper left, and so we were using drones um, to safely monitor how close that lava was getting uh, to these geothermal drill sites. Um, fortunately, um, it did not inundate that area that night, and the power plant was able to kind of evacuate um, both their personnel and any hazardous material uh, before the lava flow did eventually come onto the property uh, later in that eruption. Um, in addition to visual observations, thermal is also, as you can imagine, incredibly useful for volcanoes. The images, the two videos on the right are synced, and so you can see this is a cloud-covered Stromboli volcano in Italy. But when you have the – oh, I didn't – ah, sorry, I didn't start the lower video. So the top video is visual, lower video is thermal, and so you can see uh, a small explosion occurring in the thermal that wasn't visible due to the cloud cover uh, in the visual video on the top right. Um, Mapping with thermal also helps to identify vents. Um, the, uh, this top image is a thermal ortho photo, uh, so you can easily identify multiple vents uh, at the summit of this volcano. Uh, whereas in the visual ortho photo in the bottom, uh, you can see a lot of these gases emitted kind of obscure some of the details of exactly where the vents are and how they, large they are, knowing these precise locations and their size. Um, helps us understand kind of the impact these vents can have, how um, how they're changing, also how far they can, you know, larger vents generally made by larger explosions, more hazardous can throw material further. So understanding um, vent, vent, vent architecture um, important for hazards. Um, and so the real, you know, advance in the last decade, and this is for, you know, all science fields, I think a lot of us in geoscience have um, kind of experienced this if we've been involved in this for about the past decade, is a confluence of two kind of unconnected but contemporary advancements in hardware and software. And one is the last 10 years, uh, the advance of um, highly capable, relatively inexpensive consumer drones, you know, for the most part led by DJI. So this is showing 2013, so less than 10 years ago, DJI Phantom 1 came out. You know, so less than a decade ago. At the same time, uh, you had structure for motion photogrammetry become widely available. And so for those unfamiliar, structure for motion photogrammetry is this relatively user-friendly, straightforward workflow to turn digital photos into 3D models and digital elevation maps of terrains. And so with the ability to use a relatively user-friendly drone system, a relatively user-friendly um, computer vision photogrammetry application. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about this slide. Um, this is also just showing, yeah, the steady improvement of drone technology over the last decade, going from in the you know early 2010s, if you wanted to have a thermal camera on a drone, you had to jerry rig it, uh, strap it to a Phantom 2 or something like this image here um, from a paper in 2016. This is a setup I've used extensively. This is a DJI Matrice 210 with dual visual and thermal cameras, that's from four years ago. And now um, you have this dual, you, you know, um, you can have a DJI Mavic, much smaller platform, easier, much easier to haul up a volcano than this giant thing. Um, and you still have the visual and, and thermal combination. So in just less than a decade, um, the advancement and the capabilities of these um, systems greatly improved. So with the ability to generate DEM from uh, drone flights that you can do at your discretion, at your, you know, you can designate time frames, resolution, extent, you can create time series of eruptions. So what this um, sequence is showing is 17 digital elevation models generated of Halemaama Crater at Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii showing lava filling the crater uh, over five months 
um, in uh, early last year. Um, so you can see the rapid filling of the lake, the changing of the texture of the surface, um, uh, and a whole bunch of other things about the eruption from these time series of the EM. Um, and then kind of getting into more scientific applications, uh, you can use the DMs generated as input for numerical models of volcanic processes. And so this is an example showing that if you run, say, a lava flow model to estimate where a lava flow thank you, uh, is going to go um, during an eruption, and you use pre-eruption topography, it'll show, you know, this path on the left. But then if you take, you know, lavas erupting during the eruption, if you can use topography from the eruption, add that to the pre-eruption DEM, it can change the predicted flow path. So knowing and understanding center eruptive topography changes and being able to integrate that into the models um, can really change your hazard assessment and mitigation efforts during an eruption. Uh, similarly, you can use DEMs for slope stability assessments. So this is a basic slope stability factor of safety um, estimation where areas in red are possible areas of collapse. Uh, and when you have volcanic edifices collapse, you can generate pyroclastic flows, which are these very dense you know, can be very, um, very hot clouds of volcanic debris that can devastate areas down slope. Um, thermal images, I've showed a little bit, you can create temperature maps. This is a mud volcano in Indonesia um, doing um, photogrammetry with thermal images. And then lastly, you can move from, you know, move into time series of thermal images and start looking at the properties of surfaces. And so this is Heating rate on the left showing how different surfaces respond to solar heating. Um, the rate at which it heats as the sun rises um, can tell you about the, the composition or the circularity, uh, how porous the material on the surface is. On the right is a roughness derived from the DEM. And this is and then we can develop class, um, ground surface classification algorithms um, from that data to identify what the lava morphology is. Uh, on the surface. So this example of some um, just of, of my work and I'm about out of time. So I can take questions. I'll just mention currently uh, in the lab at Lunar Planetary Laboratory, uh, working on using drones um, in planetary analog environments and, and Iceland, and we'll be kind of using that to guide future recommendations for future Martian missions, how to use drones uh, on other planets by practicing um, here on Earth. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say uh, feel free to ask a few questions while I uh, flip over the next speaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, the, the first is, is under precaution. Uh, it's always something I keep in mind when flying. Um, I personally have not actually lost a drone. Well, I've lost one drone. Um, um, but yeah, other colleagues of mine that have had drones have had drones get caught in thermals above the but it's something to be, yeah, um, it's, you know, it's incredibly turbulent. So, uh, cautious about, and a lot of times we find ourselves kind of sacrificing a little bit of resolution or sacrificing the, don't fly a larger, more expensive flat. It would be great to fly multi spectral or fly thermal over this, but we can't risk that. We are willing to risk a little $2,000 Mavic, but we'll fly and so this, yeah, it's kind of there's a lot of on the fly um, yeah, risk management. Thank you very much. Next we have Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I got Science. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from the College of Optical Sciences, yeah. uh, UAS field used in support of Earth observation sensor calibration. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Chapel Myers. Uh, thanks to David for organizing this, and thanks to Herb for helping us out on our campus. Really. Uh, I'm research faculty in the College of Optical Sciences with the Remote Sensing Group, and so I'll just give you a brief uh, brief summary of what we've been doing with UASs. So just a quick history of our group, um, Remote Sensing Group, or RSG, we've been working on uh, pre- and post-flight uh, radiometric calibration of Earth observing sensors for long, long time, since the 1980s. Uh, we've developed a radiometric calibration laboratory. Uh, we generally work in the solar reflective regime, which is 400 to 2,500 nanometers. Uh, for our uh, post-launch cal work, we 
typically use dry lake beds um, in Arizona, Nevada, California, New Mexico. Uh, typically, we use a large one in Nevada these days. <clears throat> so what we do is during a sensor overpass, uh, we're out there on site making surface reflectance measurements. We have instruments that measure the atmosphere. We use both an irradiator transfer code to come up with uh, top of atmosphere spectral radiance, which we compare to the satellite. Uh, with more and more satellites coming on orbit in the last 10 or so years, uh, we're working towards an automated site, uh, and we call it the radiometric calibration test site, so RADCAT, uh, what we refer to, and it's similar to what we do on site with uh, on site personnel. So we use automated instrumentation, uh, which are taking data all throughout the day. And, uh, and this is similar to, as I mentioned, the work we do on site with ground personnel. So we have atmospheric measurements, we have surface reflectance measurements. And something we've started to include, uh, which includes UAS, is, is the need to measure the directional reflectance uh, of our site. More and more sensors, satellite sensors, are viewing from off nadir angles. So this is becoming more and more important. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is one of the sites where we work at in Nevada. Um, so this is just an example of some of our solar radiometers that we bring out. Uh, we have ground viewing radiometers. We typically walk the site um, doing our in situ measurements. This is called the reflectance-based approach. Uh, we have calibration panels that we measure in our laboratory um, that we use, a ratioing method to get the surface reflectance. Uh, just some more uh, images of our of our RADCAT site in Nevada. Uh, these are some of the ground viewing radiometers that we use. Uh, were developed in our lab, and this is a typical region of interest that we use up at Railroad Valley. It's one by one kilometer, and we have some instruments, you know, throughout the site that we use to characterize it. Uh, some more pictures of some of the typical instrumentation we have out there. We have a meteorological station. We have a satellite uplink station, so all of our instruments talk to a computer in the satellite uplink station. It, it connects to get who our vendor is, but uh, then it's downloaded to the U of A on a daily basis. And so we have some student projects, which is here, which is the Wiener spectrometer. And it's based on an Arduino, so we call it SPAM, which is spectrometer Arduino Mega, I think was the uh, platform used. And as I mentioned, these are some of the instruments that we uh, have developed in-house, the multispectral instruments that are used to measure the uh, surface reflectance throughout the day. Uh, some of our support equipment, we have a laboratory that I mentioned that is uh, a radiometric calibration laboratory uh, in support of our field work. Uh, we have instruments uh, called cat sitters, which are radiometers that we can bring out onto site. And you see in the top right here, this is of our ground being radiometers being calibrated with our, uh, with our cat sitter. They have typical uh, beaner wavelengths, um, both focal plane, and everything is calibrated uh, in the lab before uh, going out onto the site. And the image on the bottom right is from a DJI Phantom 3 we've had since 2016. Uh, we've gone through the process of calibrating it in our lab for radiometry and uh, Geometry and spectral cal, which is kind of interesting. So, so we eventually, um, through a USGS account uh, at the Aeros Data Center in South Dakota, who, as Kamel mentioned, uh, USGS could not fly DJI drones. Um, so we bought this a few years ago, and um, it's the uh, same uh, headwall nanospec system. Uh, that Jeff mentioned earlier. Um, it's got a nano hyperspec system on it, so we get 400 to 1,000 nanometers. And um, we're still using the calibration that came from Headball. So eventually we will do our own cal in the lab to verify it. But um, um, as Kamel mentioned, one of the issues once you start putting payload under these Matrice 600s is flight time. And he was correct about pulling your hair out. I used to have a full head of Thick black hair, blew a drone, poof, there we go. 
So, you know, we, we get about 15 minutes for $1,500 worth of batteries. So that's kind of an issue. Um, so this is just an example of it flying, you know, out at Railroad Valley, which is our premier site. Uh, so we also want to practice using our, um, typically with this system, we, we set up uh, a flight pattern here in Tucson. Uh, then we go out to our site, upload it to the drone, let it rip. You know, it takes data. Um, we're using a uh, pre-flight or flight software called uh, UGCS, which is shown here. Uh, and that came with the head wall system, or they recommended using it. Uh, this is just an example of, of flying out at Railroad Valley, shown here. And the graph here is just one example of a comparison between surface reflectance retrieval using our drone versus uh, walking around with an ASD, shown down here on the right. So they do agree pretty well. Um, we're still we're still in the process of figuring out the ins and outs of it. You know, ground resolution. Uh, flight altitude, that sort of thing. But it, it's been a fun process so far. And so in order to test the flight software, we like to do it at the U of A, which has turned out to be a pretty interesting process. Um, this is the, we were just out a few weeks ago, I think during spring break, mall just east of Optical Sciences or north of the Jefferson Gymnastics Lab, I think it is. So we, you know, we set up our, our pre-flight plans. We have our instrument out there. We have various reflectance targets and ground control targets. And the second time out, we decided we would get some signs. Looky lose away. Those tend to work pretty well. We found out they uh, work as a substitute for a fire hydrant for anybody who's dog walking. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, but for the most part, I think it gives people the idea that, you know, hey, you know, we, we put out flags and away as much as possible. The so, headwall system on the Matrice is pretty loud, pretty pretty ferocious sound. You get looky loose coming along. And I think that's all I had. It was just a brief overview. I think I said this stuff for five minutes. So um, that's really all I have for now. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, it works well for calibration, not very well for uh, some of the other work we do is um, like surface reflectance validation. And of course, there's no vegetation out there, but brighter targets tend to work well. We get a larger signal to noise ratio from the ground measurements. Um, some of the, and that's just historically what our group has worked on. Some, uh, some other groups that we work with, with uh, like South Dakota State University, they'll use dark targets, they'll use vegetative targets. The, the bright, um, of course, we don't want to go too bright. A long time ago, the group used to use white sat missile range, and that comes with all kinds of issues. It's not very reflective in the SWIR, so that's an issue with a lot of the sensors that were coming on, like MODIS, around 2000 or so. So uh, generally, we just, you know, it's, it's reasonably spectrally flat after about 1,000 nanometers. It's six, 60, 65,000, and most of that is the nano hyperspec. I think, I think the matrice is maybe five. Months. Not hyperspectral. No, I mean we just we have an Inspire two, um, but we just have a camera on it at that point. We wanted to get the SWIR system on the head wall, but that took it from sixty-five thousand to one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and there's no gimbal. It's just Nader view only. This one has a gimbal, which as was mentioned with a uh, push boom sensor, but creates all kinds of. That? that I I'm not sure. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So they can get very pricey once you get into other other sensors. So that looks like a I think a is it a mica mica sense system. Yeah, yeah we're looking. I, I wanted to talk to you about that later too because we're looking at safety. Me. Joshua Valenzi, okay. Also from the College of Optical Sciences. Excuse me, this talk will be drone detection in the reflective band. Hi, so I'm Joshua Valenzi. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student in the uh, infrared systems group led by Professor Ron Driggers in the College of Optical Sciences. And I'm presenting some work that we did on drone detection in the reflective bands. 
visible near infrared, shortwave infrared, and this new band that we're particularly interested in the extended shortwave infrared or eSphere. So that band has come up in the last couple of years. It's from two to two and a half microns. Uh, and that interest has largely been due to some advances in detector technology uh, that have let us start making focal planes a band. So first off, why are we interested in drone detection? Uh, the proliferation of drones in recent years as a low-cost aerial platform has enabled a lot of acts of terrorism, surveillance, and other kinds of security incidents, uh, including a really high-profile one where the president of Venezuela was giving a speech outdoors, uh, and some drones full of explosives were flown into the area and detonated. Um, and so there's this existing threat to all kinds of targets of value, and due to the fact that these drones have legitimate consumer appeal, uh, their payloads, flight ranges, and durations are all increasing. And so in the coming, year, coming years, threat awareness and security applications are going to require uh, drone detection capabilities. So we're studying this problem in the reflective bands, uh, as we mentioned before. And so there's trade-offs that we make with sensors in each of these bands. Uh, in the visible and near infrared, our detectors tend to be cheaper, smaller, uh, small pixel pitch, uh, don't require cooling. And then on a physics side, uh, we have better diffraction-limited angular resolution and uh, higher solar illumination uh, in those shorter wavelengths. Uh, when we move out to the SWIR and e uh our detectors tend to get bigger, more expensive, more exotic materials. Uh, in the e you actually require uh, cooling. Um, and But those are all sort of negatives. But from a physics point of view, uh, that longer wavelength gives you uh, decreased scattering, which leads to lower sky path radiance uh, and uh, better transmission through uh, long atmospheric path lengths. And so this uh, transmission plot over here in the red that was just an example for a 15-kilometer path through the atmosphere. You can see that your transmission is much higher as you go out uh, to the SWIR and E-SWIR bands. And so despite the, uh, the cost issues associated with SWIR and E-SWIR, uh, we're interested in, in these bands uh, both for if we're looking at applications where we're detecting targets against the sky, such as drone detection, uh, that lower sky path radiance is going to increase your object sky contrast and make detections much easier to make. Uh, as well as if you're looking in degraded visual environments, things like haze, smog, or smoke, uh, smog or smoke, um, you can get better transmission again because your wavelength is getting larger than your particle size, and so your transmission is much higher. Uh, and so, to work on this problem, we've built out two test beds. First, uh, one that's wide field of view with these four cameras masked at about 20 degrees. Uh, and so, you, there's some images of it here. Uh, the e sphere you may notice, is this really big camera in the middle. And it's so much bigger because it requires a TE cooling system, as well as having a very large pixel pitch. So our visible near IR and sphere cameras all have about five micron pitch, but our e sphere has 30 micron pitch. And so that obviously leads us to some IFOV issues. Um, so when we do our computational modeling of this test bed, we included an e sphere uh, detector matched at a five micron pitch with those other sensors. In parallel with this, we're also working on a narrow field of view test bed where we IFOV match all of our sensors. Uh, in order to do uh, experiments on recognition and identification tasks. And so then these uh, three small telescopes up top are for the visible near IR and SWIR sensors, and this larger telescope is for the e sphere sensor. And the difference in size there is because we need longer focal lengths uh, for the e sphere in order to match our IFOV uh, for each pixel. So the experiment that we ran uh, with our wide field of view test bed for detection was to image DJI phantom drones, both uh, one that was white and one that we painted black ourselves. Uh, in all four of our reflective bands at increasing ranges up to 250 meters uh, and at two elevation angles above the horizon, three degrees and 15 degrees. Uh, in each of our bands, we calibrated our exposure times by imaging uh, these drones alongside a highly reflective spectral on target uh, and adjusting our exposure times to make sure we're not saturating. And then in each of our frames, uh, we determined if we could make a detection as well as our signal to noise ratio uh, and our contrast. Here's some images of those drones uh, over here. I don't want to dwell on this for too long. Um, but you'll notice that, you know, black drone appears black, white drone appear, appears white until you get into the e sphere, and then suddenly they're very similar. Uh, so here's some images we took of our black drone at three degrees. Uh, we can see that we have this very high contrast, actually, in the visible and near IR due to the fact that we're looking at a dark target against a bright sky background, so a higher sky path radiance. Uh, and because we have small pitch, uh, as the drone goes out further, we're still able to make a detection uh, with very high probability. Uh, when we look in the sphere, we see that actually the gray level of our, our drone happened to very closely match the gray level of our sky background, uh, which really degraded our uh, contrast, and so we can't make a detection very far out at all. And even uh, if we uh, contrast adjust some of these images uh, to try to make them more visible for the presentation, 
uh, you still can't really see the drone in the sphere. But as when we go to the e sphere, we regain some of our contrast back. But due to that large pixel pitch, uh, we still have problems making detections uh, at very long ranges. So even if you were able to see uh, the drone in here because you know that there's a drone in here, you may not be able to make a confident detection in like the targeting uh, performance sense of a detection. Uh, so the images, images of our white drone, we do take a bit of a contrast hit uh, with the white drone because now we're detecting a white target uh, against the light background. So the contrast is lowered, but it's still pretty good and we're still able to make a detection quite well. Uh, this is also a great example of how that sky path radiance uh, decreases as you move out to longer wavelengths. You can see the sky getting progressively darker as we move out to the longer wavelength bands. And then we have a very similar thing happening in the east sphere here that we had happen in the sphere for the black drone, where our gray level of the drone matches the sky quite well. And so we are unable to make a confident detection uh, as we get further out. And here's some of our example uh, contrast plots. We can see uh, for the black drone at three degrees, we have this very low contrast uh, in the sphere, which leads us to that uh, very poor performance. We have much higher contrast in the visible and near infrared, and we normalize the y-axis to one here. Uh, so we have the high contrast in the visible and near AR, giving us good detection performance, and the east sphere kind of falling somewhere in the middle. Uh, once we move up to 15 degrees uh, elevation above the horizon, we see that our contrast is vastly improved in the sphere due to the dependence of sky path radiance on your angle of elevation because you're looking through less air, uh, you're getting less scattering off particles in the atmosphere. And so that contrast increase really helps us in the sphere. But then because we were looking at a dark target against a bright background, and when we went up to in, in the visible and near IR, and when we changed our elevation angle, our sky got darker, which made it closer to the drone as so we took a contrast hit. Uh, in 15 degrees with the visible near IR. Uh, in addition, we've done some uh, NVIPM modeling of this testbed uh, for targeting performance. Um, this is developed by Army Night Vision Lab, uh, but essentially you input uh, all of the parameters of your cameras, uh, anything, you know, noise characteristics, F number, pitch, uh, quantum efficiency, as well as characteristics of your target and background. So for us, we needed target and background reflectivities which we calculated uh, by doing a linear fit between our target of known uh, reflectivity uh, spectral on that was white and known reflectivity black is this Krylon spray paint and doing a linear fit between those to get an approximate band reflectivity uh, for both drones and for our sky background. Uh, in addition, we also uh, use the ModTran uh, atmospheric modeling software to get a solar illum illumination spectrum all the way out through two and a half microns uh, for the eSphere. And we saw that our performance uh, uh, performance curves for all of these uh, bands actually match our real world uh, results quite well. There's the probability of detection as a function of range. Uh, for the black drone, you can see that our detection probability is the best uh, and stays the highest over long ra longer ranges in the visible and near IR. It's the worst in the sphere, and then our e sphere falls somewhere in the middle. And we can also see in both of these that we get a significant performance increase uh, when we go to a five micron pitch matched e sphere uh, compared to the standard e sphere that we had on our. Uh, platform. And then a very similar thing happens when we go to the 15 degrees. Because we had that contrast in increase in the sphere, our sphere performance is uh, greatly increased uh, there. And so we also have data on signal to noise ratio and for the white drone. Time is a little bit limited here, but our main takeaways from this study was that in our wide field of view test bed, contrast was our strongest indicator of our performance alongside our pixel pitch. Our detection probability had a strong dependence on our target materials. We saw that as we went to the east, where both drones appeared to be super dark. Uh, and so the way that a material looks in, say, the visible doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of relation uh, to what its reflect reflectivity will be uh, when you go out to longer wavelengths. Our east where performance was significantly increased by uh, getting a smaller pixel pitch. Uh, and so as developments are made in these focal plane technologies, uh, we're hoping to get some performance benefits out of that uh, in the real world. Lastly, because we're dealing with a wide field of view detection test set uh, and the benefits of the sphere and e-sphere bands tend to be seen over longer path lengths or integrated visual environments, uh, this test bed didn't necessarily uh, incorporate those effects to a degree um, that we might see when we go to our narrow field of view test bed where we'll be looking over much longer path lengths. And so on that note, our path forward for this experiment is finishing building out our narrow field of view test bed for that long range targeting experiment where we match IFOVs between all of our detectors. Uh, as part of that, validating our sensor model in NVIPM for that narrow field of view test bed. Uh, and also, we're interested in other uh, eSphere focal planes. So we have one, uh, I believe it was built by 
for the cameras by Photon, et cetera. The focal plane is from this company, Episensors. But there's other groups who are working on east rear focal planes, not just Mercury, Cadmium, Telluride, uh, but you know some quantum detectors of Type 2 Super Lattice. And so we'd be interested in trying out some of those uh, focal planes as well to see what kind of results we can get out of those. That's about all I've got. No, so we don't develop focal planes, so we do more once somebody has put together a focal plane, we can get another company to put it inside a camera, and then we will do sort of real-world testing with the camera. And we're building up a lab capability for um, measuring, you know, MTFs in the lab, 3D noise, that kind of thing. So right now we're fully passive. Um, yeah, active systems, obviously, you know, more expensive and if you're trying to do these things sort of low cost or low visibility for the person observing, um, you don't necessarily want that. Okay, okay David. Yes, yeah, so feel free. Uh, I wasn't scheduled. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon almost. I wasn't scheduled to present, but I wanted to uh, just um, introduce myself. My name is Mario Castro. I'm a principal uh, at a local high school district named Pima Jated. Has anybody ever heard of Pima Jated before? So Pima Jated is a career and technical education district where we offer a multitude of uh, different courses that provide certifications, licenses, et cetera, anywhere from law and public safety to uh, cosmetology to uh, engineering licenses through SOLIDWORKS and MIM. So, uh, we just opened up an air transportation program uh, two years ago, and our focus is on drones. And so I'm here today in, in, to represent our, our district, but also to let you guys know that our, our course is growing exponentially in terms of its enrollment. And so we're always looking for instructors. We're looking at maybe in, uh, having a morning class uh, at one of our campuses. And we're also enrolling so much at my new campus, which is on Park and I-10, if you guys see the new Pima Data building, which is right next to the refinery, uh, thereabouts, uh, which is uh, uh, on the uh, west side of Park. Um, and so we have, uh, like I said, a growing, a growing uh, uh, number of students who are interested in, in, in participating in the program. But also, what we're looking to do is our, our focus is on getting that Part 107. But more importantly, what we're doing is we're building our industry base. We're building, and, and being here today and listening to all of you, we want to we build those pathways, those academic pathways to you guys so that students get to know what it is that they can study after they leave us at FEMA Day Tech. And so um, being here today is very, is very eye-opening, and I'm going to take this back to my superintendent so she knows exactly what I saw today. But more importantly, I'd ask you if you know of anyone who's interested in either teaching part-time or full-time as a FEMA Day Tech instructor. We are part of the Arizona State Retirement System. Um, I've been in education for 21 years. It's, it's a very um, inspiring thing to see kids move on and get licensing and go on to post-secondary education. So for, if any of you, if you are interested in, in, in teaching, please uh, let me know. I'll be around after lunch for a little bit, but i got to get back to my campus because classes will start. So the way that our classes work very quickly is that students go to their home high school, Tucson High, Sabino, uh, Choya, Pueblo, Desert View, and then at the end of the day, they'll come to our classes and they'll take additional classes uh, to specialize in what they're really interested in. And the air transportation program is one of those. And so um, we started off with, 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 uh, Mac, uh, with Mac Minis, I guess, so basically consumer model um, uh, drones. And we've upgraded uh, exponentially um, to a Matrice 300. So um, I think we're one of the only ones in, in Southern Arizona that actually have a Matrice 300. It's not being used very much. So if you're interested in seeing it, uh, if anybody wants to come and test it out, please let me know, and I'm happy to, to uh, help you out with that. And we're working with some LiDAR software that DGR, DGI has provided us as well. So thank you very much. Hey, that, that actually, I mean, it overlapped a little bit. I just mentioned it on one of our calls. I can't remember the company the person was from in, in Phoenix. It's uh, Adam UA Vantage. Yeah, um, he, he was really interested in, in, like, partnering with people down here about training pilots, uh, setting up training programs, even having, like, instructors from his company, I think, um, uh, do some uh, uh, training. Yeah, training. So, um, and I think also even, you know, far beyond 
get the pilot licensing, but, but there's obviously it's, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot beyond just being able to fly the thing um, as we've seen today. So uh, next it um, is, uh, is Dia. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing about your work on um, evaluation of Guayuli. Is it Guayuli or Guayuli? Why do we cover crop coefficient and yield using UAS based multi spectral data? Hi, everyone. I'm Bea Shika, and as he said, today we'll talk about remote sensing of flight exceeded Wyuli. Uh, this is uh, part of uh, what's called the S BAR project, which is the sustainable bioeconomy for arid regions. So, using drone for agriculture. We can use a drone for agriculture for many things. For example, we can uh, like uh, assess seedling emergence. Uh, we can take a look at the crop health, like when it comes to like uh, weed infestation or insect infestation or water stress. Also, we can use it to for irrigation water management. So we can uh, estimate some components used for uh, estimation of crop evapotranspiration, such as the crop coefficient and fractional canopy cover. Uh, also, we can uh, take a look at the plant growth and uh, uh, do assessment for final yield. We have used many drones. For example, this one, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. It's called 3DR uh, Solo Drone, which was carrying uh, Red Edge, uh, which is a multispectral sensor by MicaSense. Also, we use this one, the drone that you see here, which is an Inspire drone carrying Alcan sensor, which is similar to the other sensor, but it has a thermal band. Every time we collect drone data, as you know, uh, we would have to do calibration using this calibrated reflectance panel. So we collect images for it uh, before the drone flight. My drone flights were basically like 10, 15 minutes, so we didn't have to do it before and after just one time. Also, we collected RGB data using a Phantom 4 Professional D2 drone. Uh, I've used a uh, Pixel D Capture uh, Mission Planner, and this application is really easy to use, very useful. So um, I can adjust like front and side overlaps, and I've used overlaps above 75%. During the flight, you can see some information about the drone itself, like the batteries, what's the percentage, and you know the field area, altitude, and some other information. Image processing. Uh, we have used the uh, X4D mapper. So basically, you collect like hundreds or even thousands of images, and then we transfer it to you into GeoReference 2D or some mosaics. And as you know, the drones have GPS devices on them, so each picture would have some GPS information. However, sometimes we have a signal dropout, or you know, sometimes we have wind uh, drift, so this would change, you know, the GPS information dramatically. In this case, we would need what's called ground control points, which are points distributed in the field with known locations, basically. And uh, the minimum numbers that we use was for GPS. Uh, uh, points distributed at the corners of the field. We didn't have that. I just received this drone, the white one, which is drone carrying a multi-spectral sensor that has also an RGB uh, uh, RGB camera. This one has a base, like which is has a, a real-time kinematic or RTK, so it can correct the location of each image. Uh, during the flight itself, or sometimes if you need after the flight. So if you have this drone, you don't need the ground control point. So the third thing we would talk about is detection of weeds and water stress. For example, this image on the right, it's a triangular vegetation index. And this uh, index can be created using RGB data or multispectral data. And as you can see, the the Wayuli, I forgot to mention that it's a uh, uh, shrub used to produce rubber. It looks a little bit different from regular plants, so it's not really green. So you can differentiate between the plant 
and the weeds at the beginning, like in the first two months or even three months, because of the difference in color, difference in size, as you can see in this image, all these dots at the bottom are weeds inside the field. So with one image, you can detect where the weeds are and then you can ask the people to come and take care of it. The CGI also can be used to detect water stress. We had five irrigation treatments, ranging from 50% of crop evapotranspiration to 150. As you can see from this image, the 50% are having lower TGI values from the 75%. And the top plot was green or even green, which means it had more uh, uh, higher values of TGI because it's 150% of evapotranspiration. So higher water application rates. Also, NDVI, which is a normalized difference vegetation index, can be used to detect water stress, but it can be affected by other factors. Um, as you can see, same thing, like the lower irrigation uh, rates, which is D50, was like kind of yellow, which is lower NDVI values compared to the D75, which is a little bit more greener. And the top one was receiving the highest amount of water, it's more greener, which means higher NDVI values. We use the image that I uh, displayed before to extract this information. So basically, these are averages per plot. As you can see, for the D100 to D150, which are the treatments receiving higher water amounts, we have higher NDVI values. Then we got the, the Inspire drone, which is carrying a thermal band. It has a thermal band. So uh, if you have like a blue color, that means the plants are cooler than the plants are having uh, with the red color. So basically, the D150 is receiving like a um, good amount of water. It has lower temperature than D50, which was as uh, uh, red in that image. Same thing here. These are the averages for uh, plot temperature. The plots receiving higher amount of water, D100 to D150, were having lower uh, surface temperature. Then we can use a the thermal uh, data to give you like temperature also with NDVI to create what's called water deficit index. It's an index that ranges from zero to one with one that shows stress. As you can see here, the full treatment is a treatment that is receiving good amount of water. Looks like uh, the color is uh, uh, blue, which means lower water deficit index values, which means there is no stress compared to the ones that are receiving three irrigations per year or one irrigation per year, as you can see, they look uh, like uh, red or uh, yellow in color, which means they have a uh, higher water deficit uh, index values, which means they, they are stressed. Also, so I mentioned that we can collect some information, uh, like remote sensing information that can be used to uh, calculate or predict cover crop coefficients which are uh, important inputs for irrigation models. Also, you can use this data to predict the final yield, which can help you uh, for the after, uh, like post-harvest, you know, uh, uh, operations. For example, this one shows you the fractional can, can be covered, collected, uh, calculated using RGB data as compared to the fractional can, can be covered uh, which was uh, manually measured, right? There is a very good correlation between them, and we have a good equation with good R square. And the RGB uh, fraction can, can be covered basically was based on the hue value. So we use the hue value to differentiate the green pixels from the soil pixels. Then when you divide the number of green pixels by the total uh, number of uh, pixels for plot would give you the fraction that can be covered. Also, we can use NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, to also calculate cover, fractional can be covered. And we created this nice equation with a high R square. A very important uh, factor is the crop coefficient. Also, we correlated the NDVI values to crop coefficient for Waiuli. As you can see from the top one, it's for the first year. It's a two-year crop. We have two equations. The top one would be for the active growth, during active growth equation. The other one is during dormancy. The second uh, figure would show you the a linear 
equation for the entire year. Also here, the prediction, we have three types of yield. We have the dry biomass, we have the resin yield, and we have the rubber yield. And we have collected uh, NDVI uh, data during the second year, during the active growth, and we correlated that to all these uh, uh, components, and we have like relatively good equations to do the prediction. Any questions? I have one. I, I noticed that you had a, a lower R squared when calculating canopy cover from NDVI than when calculating. Is that on the same field, or yeah, it's the same field. Is, is that like? Um, I mean, I, I, if I had, I'm not as familiar, but um, in the art, the, the the but also the cover would be the same thing, right? Because it, this is very precise. Like for each single pixel, you would know whether this is plant or, you know, maybe yeah, differentiate plant from soil, so you can get the same thing, right? And uh, also, NDVI may be affected by the fact that you know, during the first year, you're affected by um, like different things. It doesn't have to be cover only, right? Mm -hmm. So, but, but both of them are above 90%, and they cannot really judge it by the 6% in, in R square, I would say. Okay, and how does the yield prediction compare to yield prediction? Bad at all. I tried, and they are very similar. That's why they did not display the other data, but I have it published, and it's very similar, I would say. Yeah, which makes sense that I would show you the other one because it's easier and less expensive. But uh, yeah, RGB did really well when it comes to prediction of uh, like dry biomass and finance. So our, um, our next speaker, who is um, to be joining from uh, remotely. Be exciting. Yeah. You can see show up. Um, in the meantime, I, I, I did want to show us, uh, point out a few things. So, because um, I was mentioning the drone discuss, discussion group. Um, so, for those of you, drones at Arizona .edu, For those of you who, who haven't. Um, who haven't joined our talks or aren't on the uh, UAS um, mailing list, um, this is a you know one place to do it. We just we, we threw up the, the uh, website. I'll give Chris most of the credit for it. Um, to uh, you know just as a place to put together some information. And this is where you came for the event. You know for the um, for today's event. And um, but I yeah mainly wanted to make sure that, that folks were aware of where to to. Um, um, yeah, it's usually pre form discussion when we can. We get, you know, we have a speaker and a, and a topic. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had tutorials, we've had, you know, all sorts of discussions, really good ones. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and say it doesn't seem like our final speaker will, will show up. Uh, we still have, um, it's probably going to be about 13 minutes until the burritos show up, um, and so in between now and then, um, I invite you all to uh, amongst y'all's selves. <laughs>